life changes a little bit with your circumstances. It becomes a little less clear, a little less important. Jesus was a little less important to Peter when a little 14-year-old girl was asking him some questions. Demas, who loved the world, Jesus became a little less important to him when it became a choice between Jesus and the world. And so we need to keep our eyes on Jesus. Amen. Amen. I want to get close to Jesus.
when you get past the outside, but the other three knew you were, but you, you walk in and you press in and you get into the inner courts. I'm telling you, it's something different. There's so many of us, we stop on the outside, but God doesn't want a people that stops on the outside. That's why when we worship, there's some pressing in. There is some, uh, there's some plowing, amen? Because we don't want to quit just at the outside gate. No. Christ died so we can come in and have fellowship with Him. Man. When we come in, the Spirit of God can touch you more than any sermon that I can ever preach from this pulpit. Amen. If you allow Him to touch your heart. Amen. amen. Give the Lord a hand and clap this This week, as I, I pray for the worship team on a regular basis, um, we got very, very gifted, talented, and anointed worship teams. Amen? Amen. It blesses us that we have that in the house of God. But the Lord really laid something upon my heart, and true worship is the Word of God. Amen? Amen? Amen. Because when you're obedient to the Word of God, that truly shows what's inside of our heart. Amen? For so many times, it's easy for us to raise our hands and to praise God, but it's very hard. No one knows if your heart is praising God or if you surrender to God. Amen? Amen. Many of us, even in here today, it's a lot easier to lift that right hand than that left hand and, and worship the Lord. But God really wants a contrite heart. He wants a spirit that is broken before Him. Amen? Amen. So I thank you for coming to the house of God today. And if you are a visitor, we welcome you. We've been praying for you. And you say, how in the world have you been praying for us? Because you're a visitor. Amen. I mean, it's not by chance you walked into a place called New Beginning. Amen. For some of you, you you're, you've been gone so long from the church, you're a visitor. Amen. But we love you. Praise be to God. Amen. We thank God for you. We lift you up in prayer all the time. Turn with me to Judges. Amen. Turn with me to the book of Judges. And I share with you when we start a, a series going through the book of Judges, and I believe it's a very important book in the Word of God that is very neglected, amen, because of the word judge, amen. As children of God, God forbid someone must judge us, amen. But the book of Judges is very powerful. The book of Judges, saints of God, in this time period that we're about to see is, the book of Judges is a period of time defined by lawlessness, rebellion, moral failure among the Israelites. The whole attitude of Israel during the time of Judges can be summed up in these words. Judges 17, uh, chapter 6, uh, verse 6, where the Bible says, In those days there were no king in Israel, but every man did that which was right in his own eyes. How many of you can agree today that that's where our nation is headed? Amen? And that's where we are. Everyone just does right in their own eyes. How many times as Christians you went to minister to someone and they said, well, your life is your life and my life is my life. Don't get involved in my life and I won't get involved in your life. Yeah. Amen? You can do what you want. I can do what I want. But don't you dare come 
Because that old man, you were the one that had nothing to do with that old man. Amen? Hallelujah. You know what I'm talking about. Amen? That old man had bitterness and hatred. That old man had lust. That old man had fornication and adultery. That old man could never be tamed. I did it and I wanted more of it. It was never enough in that old man. Amen? But when I came to the foot of Calvary, I'm all. And I threw up my hands and said, I don't know a lot, but there's one thing I don't know. I am tired of trying to live this life in my own strength, in my own ability. And in all of a sudden, there was a man named Jesus. Hallelujah. That touched my life and transformed it. Come on. And the word of God says, he set me apart for such a time as this. Saints of God, God commanded them to enter Canaan and to conquer it. This is Deuteronomy 7. The commandments given in those verses are crystal clear. They were to what? Possess the land. What was the next thing they were to do? Utterly destroy all the nations of Canaan. Next, they were to make no peace treaties with them. Next, they were to show them no mercy. Next, they refused to intermarry with them. Next, they would completely destroy every trace of their pagan religion. Saints of God, the reason why they were commanded to do this was because Israel was to be different from all the people around them. Deuteronomy 7.6 says, For you are a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for himself. A special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. Hallelujah. Saints of God, it's not by chance that wherever you are at, that the Spirit of God touched your heart and your life. It's not by circumstance. There's some of you were in a bar, some of you were in your car, some of you in a church, but the Spirit of God said, today is the day of salvation, came down and moved upon your heart, and hid if you ran from it for a long time. Amen. But that home hound dog of heaven, Brother Joseph, searched you out, and never quit. And when he found you, he penetrated that old hard heart, and turned that stony heart so on the flesh, you throw up your hands and you said, all right then, praise be to God, I give you my heart. Amen. And if you can be honest with yourself, from that day forward, from that day forward, it has been a rod. But I say, I said this a long time ago and I say it again, my best day in the world does not compare to my worst day in Christianity. Hallelujah. Praise be to God. Hallelujah. Saints of God, they were among all the people of the earth. They had been chosen by God. He had saved and blessed them and promised them victory if they would walk with Him. You know, God today demands total separation among His people. Can we be honest with each other today? Can we be honest that it's hard in this world to separate Christians from non-Christians? Can somebody say amen? amen? It's hard to distinguish, except for you take away their bumper sticker that I love God. You take away the, the church emblems on the back of their vehicle. You take away the Christian shirts. And really, it is really almost impossible to know right now that if someone is a Christian or not. But when God sets you apart, He puts something inside of you called the Holy Ghost. The Bible calls that dunamis, which is dynamite power. Oh, oh. You can try all you want to try to hide that thing, but that thing. 
saints of God. The Lord knew that if He would allow Israel, or if they would be entangled with the Canaanites, that they would become corrupt spiritually and be drawn away from God. Deuteronomy 7, 4 through 5 says, For they will turn your sons away from following me to serve other gods. Do we realize that today the seriousness of you devil dabbling halfway in the world and halfway with Christ? Do you parents, husband, men of God, women of God in here, children of God in here, do you realize the consequences of just almost, almost getting completely set apart for God? Do you realize the things that we are allowed to come into our households on the TV, on the radio,
something happens. But you know what the Bible says? But they dwell in the land with them. I hope you see a pattern coming along here. What about Ephraim? The same thing. They drive out the Canaanites. They drove some out but left some. And the Bible says they dwell with them. What about Asher? The Bible says that they drove Which 
And she was used. He gave a riddle, remember, to his men that came, 30 men that came. He gave a riddle and said, if you find this out, number one, that's messing with God's anointing. Play the game with the anointing of God. You find this riddle out, he said, I'll give you all this clothes. I'll give you a tunic. I'll give you a dress. I'll do all these things. Just, if you find this riddle out, who do they go to and try to find this riddle out? This woman. They go to her and they say, come on, you got to tell us this. We want to know this riddle. She keeps nagging him and nagging him and finally the Bible says she told them. What happens is Samuel finds out and finds out that they, 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 they manipulated his wife. He goes and kills all 30 of them. Now murder. See what sin does? Little leaven leavens the whole thing. Then he kills them. And then they come back and kill that supposedly be wife. Set her on fire and her dad. Sin doesn't just affect you. It affects everybody that's around you. And then what happens? Mr. Mighty Man, the strongest man in the entire town, the Lord of God, but besides Jesus. But yet he was also the weakest man. He had a problem. And the one problem was the W, women. The next time one comes, like a woman named Delilah. You all know the story. It's a different woman than the first woman. Then he comes and kind of the same thing happens. The first woman was just a Philistine. Now this woman is a Philistine prostitute. It gets worse. He spends two days in a foreign land with this woman, trying to hide out. Comes back home and says, Mom, I found them. His parents say, one in our midst, son. I had to put a leash so tight on that dude. You know those little things when you see people going in public? You know those little kids are running? And they're not going nowhere? I had to grab him by those locks of hair and say, you're not going anywhere. Amen? Why? He, 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 legalism on me, daddy. You, you, you don't love me. No, I'm doing this because I do love you. Right now, you can't make the right decision and you're not going anywhere. Hallelujah. He didn't. He's my little going today. God's going to do great work in my little man. He will, but if. Amen. Amen. God has given you a responsibility as parents to lead your children in the ways of the Lord, to make a stand when everybody else might look around it. His parents are so strict, yes, but I can promise you this. I know the promises of God. I know what the Bible says. If I teach them in the way they should go, they might go get grass in another street, but they're coming back home to the house of God. Hallelujah. He marries, you know, marries. What happens? He says, uh, the, the Philistines say, go find out where his strength is. Finds out it's in the hair. They go through this long list of things. He tells them, if you tie my hands with this type of rope, and you tie my foot with that type of rope, it's going to work. And they tie him up and he goes, that's messing with God's anointing. He's playing the game. And it finally comes to where, he finally says, the Bible says, that she's not so much. Now you so much that you finally said, okay, okay already. My strength is in my hair. I'm a Nazarite and I'm not supposed to cut it. And what does she do? First thing she does is she cuts it and it goes to the Philistines. That's not even the saddest part of the entire thing. The saddest part of the entire thing, saints of God, is that he wakes up the next morning and don't even realize that the anointing of God has left his life. He wakes up and he says, the same way that I went out and came in is the same way I'm going to go out now and defeat those Philistines. But the problem was he lost the anointing of God. How many of you? You did with that a little bit in sin and, and a little bit you, you say in your mind, God's grace and his house is a place of refuge and his grace is so long-suffering. Saints, they won't come a time that a sparrow's heart was hard. Your heart will be a heart. And you might not be able to come back to the house.
yet when he died, you were in more bondage than when he came to the scene. Say to God, you're in the house today. The Lord is calling you. The Lord has called you to be set apart. He has called you to be set apart. And you did with that in the things of the world. And you did with that in the church. Don't play this game anymore. Yeah. Say, God, I don't want to play this anymore. You have called me and set me apart for this reason, for this purpose. And I'm going to keep pressing in Jesus. Yeah. Saints of God. Israel's failure to defeat their enemies resulted in them living among their enemies. After a while, they became like their enemies. I'm going to share something with you on that. How many of you have friends that are still in the world? They say, Pastor Kim, well, how are we going to reach the world if we're not with them? Again, you're in the world, you're a boat in the ocean, but God forbid the ocean gets in the boat. Amen? Come on. You're in them, but you're not with them. You are set apart. And I'm going to be very blunt today. You might not have ever heard that from come from a pastor's mouth in a long, long time. But if we serve God, they serve the devil. They're not saved. Yeah. Very clear. Yeah. We serve Christ and we're a child of God. They serve the devil because they're not saved. Amen? Yeah. Simple. Amen. But what we do is instead of us standing firm in the word of God and not compromises, we surround ourselves with these with these, uh, with these uh, Philistines and, and we think, well, we start off with a good motive. I'm going to reach them for Christ. Boy, God has put that one on my heart. And pretty soon you, you, you start reaching them and they turn away from you, God. Amen. Now you're not as bold as you used to be anymore. Now you got another one in your midst that you start reaching for Christ. And pretty soon is what starts happening. Instead of you transforming them, they start transforming you. Yes. Yes. Am I right? You surround yourself with people that go out and party. You surround yourself that their God is their money. Guess what? Your God is going to start to be money as well. <clears throat> I'm very choosy on my friends. Very, very choosy. My wife and I pray about that all the time. I'm saying, I, I love those that are going to edify each other, encourage each other, tell each other the truth. I don't want no yes men by my side. I don't know about going to tell me because I'm pastor. Yeah, pastor, that's a good idea. No, I want to be able to say, pastor, that's not of God. But I also want those that have the same heart and desire for the children of God in the church. I want those that say, I want to be bankrupt for Christ spiritually. I want to understand that He's all I need, He's all I have, and I thank God for it. That's what I want to surround myself with. You surround yourself with those that are the Joneses. You're going to become Jones Jr. You surround yourself with those that are eyes on the things of the world. Pretty soon you're high. You got the same vision they will. The things of the world. You know, it blows my mind, saints of God. It really does. I still I pray about this all the time. We have such a precious promise in Christ. He says he's given us everything we can possibly ever need or ever want. But yet we're jumping the fence and going back to the world. Why in the world is not, why in the world is not the world jumping the fence and trying to come in our pasture? Huh? I know this, almost 14 years ago when I gave my life to the Lord, you know, and brought my wife to Christ, she says, I want what you have. She saw a transformation of this man of anger, this man of jealousy, this man of lust, of pornography and alcohol. She saw me immediately. She was, <laughs> you're not the same man. I hope not. Because he said, I'm dying with him on the grave. And on the third day, he rose me up to do this. I praise God I'm not the same man. Hallelujah. Saints of God, when you refuse to get rid of those things in your life, those people in your life, those addictions in your life, those bondages in your life, when you refuse to get rid of them pretty soon, you start adopting it, now it's okay. Remember that day when a rated, rated, uh, what is the rate? I don't know the rate. PG-13. PG-13, yeah. Remember the day that was PG-13 as a young Christian, you were like, we ain't watching that. Huh? PG-13, yeah, but mom and dad, they only say GD and it doesn't know. 
Huh? Remember those days? Some of the video games you let your kids play. God forbid. Hallelujah. Those murder games? Grand Theft Auto. Are you serious? They rape and they pillage and they rob and they steal and they get points for doing it. And we wonder, I'm not sure why my kids act them out.
God, if we become a church that people would have to say that's not natural, that's supernatural. Praise God that people would be able to look in the midst of our people and see all of our youth that say they make a stand and say, Pastor King, we don't believe in dating. Why? Because what more will you do dating a man and a boy as a Christian than a friend? If you're just a friend and you're not married, what more are you going to do as a Christian? Free. Huh? Yo, help me out here. What more? We don't, we don't, and I'm going to tell you guys, us, our family has decided. My little girls come to me and say, Dad, I, I want a purity ring. And I, I explained to her, I said, it's not kryptonite, my baby. That little ring won't, won't. There's many men who wear this ring and commit adultery and fornication daily. Amen. This is not power in it. However, I understand. I sat down with her and I was blessed and I said, my baby purity starts in the hearts. Yeah. It starts you making a stand for God. It is saying, That's what I want to share with you with today. It's never too late. Amen. You're setting the precedence in your house for when they grow up, what they think of church, what they think of Christ, and what they think of God. You're setting that precedent. They always get yelled at, spanked, beaten. Then that's what they think God is. If you're loving them unconditional, if you're protecting them, you're teaching them the word, that's who they're going to want when they grow up. I want that God. Saints of God, in Judges, there's a man that rises up, that God calls up. His name is Othniel. And you know what blesses me is in chapter 3 is, his name means power of God or lion of God. He comes from the tribe of Judah. The first judge is from the tribe of Judah. Praise be to God. What tribe did Christ come from? The lion of the tribe of Judah. If God does things right, he does it right the first time. Amen? Hallelujah. But because Israel refused to walk with the Lord, like he commanded them, he refused to drive out all of their enemies in the land of Canaan. 